faculty for today is Dr. Deepak Vijayan. He is the head of the department and senior consultant of critical care in KIMS hospital in Trivandrum and his area of interests are sepsis and neurocritical care. Thank you the academy for giving me an opportunity to be here with you today. So I will be speaking about the status seizure which is a very common uh, occurrence in any ICU. Yeah, in any major ICU, there will be at least a couple of cases in a month. So it is one of the most common medical emergencies. So I will be speaking mostly on the status seizure in adults. Usually it is a panicky situation when a patient presents with a status seizure. Because the patient will be seizuring, you will have to uh, secure the airway at, as an emergency and all. And there is not much difficulty in diagnosing a convulsive status seizure. There are two types of status seizure, convulsive and non-convulsive. I will come into the details of that uh, in, in the uh, later few slides. So uh, whenever a patient presents with a status seizure, the diagnosis is almost certain, certain that the patient is seizuring. And we have to work up on the etiology. Sometimes when a patient presents with an abnormal mendation, we might have to depend on the EEG to find out what exactly is the reason. And there are various causes for the seizures which needs to be tackled. And the prognosis depend on the uh, age and uh, uh, the severity of seizure and also on the etiological causes. And treatment differs between the convulsive, non-convulsive and focal seizures. So the International League of Epilepsy Association has defined status epileptic as conventionally as a seizure that is uh, persisting for more than 30 minutes or two or more sequential seizures without full recovery of consciousness between the seizures. But this definition has an issue because when the seizure lasts for th more than 30 minutes, there is a risk of a neurological damage. Hence, there is a, another definition which is put forward by ILEA in 2015, the operational definition, which uh, is used for the clinical management of status seizure. <clears throat> it states that the status treatment protocols have used a five-minute definition to minimize the risk of seizures reaching 30 minutes and the adverse outcomes associated with needlessly intervening on brief self-limited seizures. That means for all practical consideration, if a patient is seizuring for more than five minutes, that should be considered as a status seizure. The ILEA on 2015 has also came out with the time one and time two. T1 is a time at which ongoing seizure activity should be regarded as abnormally prolonged, unlikely to stop spontaneously and when treatment for status epilepticus should be started. That is called the time one. I will come to the significance of the T1 and T2 in the next slide. See, like the T2 is the time after which the ongoing seizure activity poses a significant risk of long-term complication. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, the operational dimension of T1 time is T1 is the time at which when a seizure is likely to be prolonged, leading to continuing seizure activity. And for tonic clonic status epilepticus, it is five minutes. And for a focal uh, status epilepticus with impaired consciousness, it is 10 minutes. And for an absent status epilepticus, it is 10 to 15 minutes. The significance of T1 is that we should start treating the patients in this time duration. And what is the significance of the time T2? The significance of time T2 is that the risk of neurological damage associated increases after the T2 time. That is a tonic-clonic seizure existing more than 30 minutes or a focal status epilepticus with impaired consciousness lasting more than 60 minutes. And in the absence status epilepticus, which is a form of non-convulsive status epilepticus, the T2 time is not defined. And coming to the classification, the classification of seizure status seizures can be based on four axes. One is 
on the semiology, that is the onset and progression of the seizures. Second is depending on the cost, on the cost, that is the etiology of the seizures. And third is depending on the EEG classification. And fourth, depending on the age as infantile seizures, neonatal seizures, childhood seizures, and adult onset seizures. For a, from a practical point of view, I have uh, summarized the uh, classification of st status epilepticus broadly into convulsive and non-convulsive. And we will concentrate more on the convulsive management of the convulsive status epilepticus today. And convulsive, convulsive status epilepticus, epilepticus can be again classified into generalized and focal. That is, in the generalized uh generalized status can be either primarily generalized or it starts as a focal seizure and then get secondarily generalized also the generalized uh sc can be myo due to myoclonus continuous myoclonic activity can also lead to status epilepticus and also tonic clonic and atonic movements can present as uh, generalized convulsive status seizures Sometimes there will be only focal seizures without generalization, which is called a focal convulsive status epilepticus. Now coming to the non-convulsive status epilepticus, the clinical seizures are not evident in such cases and only elect uh, EEG evidence of seizure will be present. But the patient will have uh, abnormal mentation. Typical example is the absent seizure where the patient uh, might uh, look clinically normal, but she will be unaware of the surroundings. It's called the absent seizure. And other primarily primary generalized non-convulsive status epilepticus are there, and also atypical status uh, non-convulsive status seizures are there. And like uh, convulsive status seizures, non-convulsive also has got a focal onset non-convulsive status seizure with a motor features and without motor features. And one of the most important classification of status seizure is based on the etiology because your management of the status seizure, etiology is very important. And according to the etiology, the stat status seizure can occur due to an underlying structural lesion, it can be due to infections like encephalitis or meningitis, and also like metabolic derangements like a hepatic encephalopathy or a uremia or a hyponatremia or a hypokalemia, all precipitating seizures. And provoked seizures are the conditions where there is a reason or a cause for seizures. And unprovoked seizures are conditions where there is no uh, cause for a seizure, evident cause for a seizure. One of the most common cause of uh, a breakthrough seizure is the non adherence to anti seizure medications. Also, alcohol withdrawal many times presents as seizures. Certain drugs, especially in renal failure patients, can precipitate seizure. Examples are the most commonly used miropinum and also the uh, fluoroquinolone group of antibiotics. And another important etiology is the autoimmune causes. Here, uh, the NMDA receptor antagonist LG. LG1 and the uh, receptor antibodies, all these can cause uh, autoimmune. Uh, all these are causes of autoimmune uh, etiology for seizures. And in children, the most common cause of seizure is the fib fibril seizure. So uh, we will go to the MCQs. There will be five, uh, uh, total 10 MCQs will be there. And five will be the A type, and the next five will be the uh, care type questions. The first one is the mortality from first episode of generalized convulsive status seizure is between. First, A is 10 to 15, B is 16 to 20, C is 20 to 25, D is 25 to 30. Uh, participants, I would urge you to either unmute yourself to answer the question or at least you can put it in the chat box. Uh, yeah. Dr. Vijayan, I would suggest you keep an eye on the chat box also. Yeah, there are a few C and there are a few A, and I think the correct answer is A because after the first episode of seizure, the uh, first episode of status seizure, it's not the, we uh, are speaking about the status seizure. The first episode of status seizure, the risk of death is 10 to 15%.
And the second question is, which of the following has the lowest risk of congenital anomaly uh, among the anti-epileptics? One, uh, the option A is liver trisetam, B is phenytoin, C is valproid, and D is phenobarbital. I think uh, few, there are few answers as A and few answers as B. The correct answer is uh, A, that is liver trisetam, because phenytoin is uh, known to cause fetal hydantoin syndrome and it should, should, should be avoided. Valproate is also contraindicated in pregnancy. Phenobarbital is also not a drug of choice in uh, pregnancy. Only in desperate situation, phenobarbital is given in pregnancy. So the uh, correct answer would be divitrocytum, which can be safely given in pregnancy. First maintenance Coming to the next question, that is, first maintenance dose of phenytoin should be given after how many hours of loading dose? Whether it is, we, that is the question is, we give the loading dose, how long we should get, wait to start the regular maintenance dose? Uh, option A is 8 hour, B is 12 hour, C is 24 hour, and D is only if seizure recurs. The option is not B, it is uh, 8 hour. That is, uh, uh, phenytoin should be given uh, eight hourly, and it should be started eight hour after the loading dose. Now, coming to the next question, which of the following is associated with a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis? Suppose there is a patient with a refractory seizure who is receiving high dose ketamine A infusion, lorazepam, high dose metasolamine infusion, and which medication can cause? No, uh, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. In the earlier discussion, we have told that the propofol can cause metabolic acidosis, that is the propofol infusion syndrome. But other than propofol, one of these drugs can also cause uh, 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 metabolic acidosis, that is a high dose of ketamine infusion is known to cause uh, normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So whenever a patient is uh, on high dose ketamine infusion, you should always monitor for developing acidosis. And the next question is comparatively simple. I think uh, you'll be able to answer. Hyperammonemia is caused by high dose metasolam, levetiracetam, valproate, phenytoin. The correct answer is sodium valproate. Valproate is known to cause hyperammonemia. It's a very uh, common side effect of sodium valproate. And last question from the uh, A type MCQ Which of the following anti epileptic should be avoided on a patient receiving meropinum? Uh, this is a very interesting question. Like a patient in ICU, most of them will be having some uh, type of pneumonia and he will be started on meropinum. Suppose this patient also has. Uh, uh, Epilepsy, which drug should be avoided? Which anti epileptic should be uh, avoided if the patient is receiving meropina? Valproate should not be used in when the patient is receiving meropinum because meropinum, carbapinum can uh, reduce the uh, dose of valproate and, be, and uh, make it inefficient. So, in such cases, valproate should be discontinued and another alternative anti epileptic should be used. K type question. Like here you will have uh, multiple answers can be correct. So you have to, it's basically the true or false type. Autoimmune etiology is suspected in A, new onset seizure presenting a status seizures, progression to refractory status seizure or super refractory status seizure, known history of malignancy, New psychiatric symptoms or behavioral changes, all of the above. Autoimmune etiology is suspected in all of the above because autoimmune etiology is one of the most common cause of uh, refractory status issues. And also, stat patients presenting with status issues, one of the most common causes is autoimmune etiology. So among the following drugs, which of the following is the additional treatment option for refractory status seizure? This we have discussed in our class. 
A is metasolum, B is levetiracetam, C is ketamine, and D is propofol. Both C and D can be additional treatment options of refractory seizure. Metasolum and levetiracetam are usually for mm, the first and second line of treatment of the status seizure, whereas ketamine and propofol usually used for seizures which are refractory, which goes more than 30 minutes. And the next question is, which is true about ketamine? Ket ketamine is a NMDA antagonist. It causes hypotension and bradycardia. It's used in the treatment of refractory seizures. Causes thrice in CPK with prolonged infusion. Ketamine is an anesthetic drug and it is an NMDA antagonist. So, uh, option A is true. It do not cause hypotension and bradycardia, but it causes tachycardia and hypertension because it's a cardiac stimulant. So, B is false. And ketamine is used in treatment of refractory seizures that we have already discussed. So that is true, and it causes rise in CPK with prolonged infusion. Ketamine do not cause rise in CPK. It is propofol which is causing rise in CPK with prolonged infusion. And the thing which we have not discussed is the breakthrough seizure. What should we do when we have a breakthrough seizure? Breakthrough seizure require a higher dose of antiepileptic gas, longer duration of treatment, additional antiepileptics, and close monitoring of EEG. All these are required for breakthrough seizures. So treatment goals of status include a complete seizure control both clinically and by continuous EEG monitoring. Yes, that is true because it is not sufficient that the patient improves clinically. There should be EEG evidence of abolition of seizure. EEG evidence of abolition, abolition of seizure alone is not sufficient because then it is equivocal. So, patient should be clinically improving also. And when we attain seizure control, infusion should be continued for 12 hours after seizure control. No, that is not correct. Infusion should be continued at least for 24 to 48 hours. Infusions should be continued at least for 24 hours once seizure control is obtained. Bus suppression in EEG is mandatory. This we have discussed. Bus suppression in EEG is not mandatory. In some school of, one school of thought prefers bus suppression in EEG. And there are some studies which shows that once bus suppression is achieved, the chance of recurrence is less. But that is not, um, there is not much evidence for that. So bus suppression in EEG is not mandatory. It might be good if you have it. And close monitoring of EEG is required. That is true. So this uh, brings us to the end of the session. And now the uh, topic is open to discussion. I am ready to take any, and I am happy to take any questions. Yeah, I speak about the ketamine. What I understand is that ketamine, one of its um, side effects that increase yeah. uh, cerebral uh, oxygen uh, yes yes on, yes and all this stuff so uh, how does it make sense to make yeah it yeah sense? yeah uh, very good question actually ketamine is a nmda receptor antagonist so what happens when there is a nmda receptor antagonism is the depressive uh, neurotransmitter glutamine increases so when the glutamine increases it causes uh, it abolishes the seizure activity and that is how as you said, ketamine increases cerebral blood flow that is there. But what happens is when this uh, NMDA receptor antagonism increases the uh, neurotransmitter glutamine level inside the brain, the seizure activity decreases. And that is the mechanism of abolition of seizure activity. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you so much. Sir. Great. So with that, Dr. Vijayan, we will conclude tonight's session.